Today's episode is brought to you by Amazon. Please go to lookingbackpodcast.com anytime you want to shop from Amazon and click the banner on the front page. And what that does is that takes you to Amazon.com like normal, but out of whatever you spend, Amazon sends back a percentage to the show, and it's a great way to help us out. We would also appreciate any and all donations that you wish to send or give. Please click the donate button on the front page of the website, lookingbackpodcast.com. There are two options. One, you can give a one-time donation, or you can become a monthly uh, donator. Any and all donations are greatly appreciated, and you will also get to decide the topic for a future show. I want to make this more about you guys and something that you enjoy. So thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. And today, we're going to have a very special show, talking about one of my favorite bands of all time. Let's take a look back at Iron Maiden. Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Looking Back, where we take a look back at interesting things in, well, in the world. I'm going to branch out from history and just uh, kind of stretch out uh, the different topics that I want to talk about. And ones that I really feel that, uh, quite honestly, you would find interesting. Because I want to make this about you guys and something that you enjoy. Because let's face it. Not everyone wants to sit for a half hour, 45 minutes, while I go on and on and on about, you know, the Battle of Hastings. Got to make this entertaining. And I never really talked about a band on this podcast before. And I figured, you know what, let's do it. And I decided, okay, what band could I talk about? What band has a, a very interesting uh, history, and one that I feel that you would uh, really enjoy. And I go, you know what? Let's talk about one of my favorite bands, and one of the bands that I've been a fan of since high school. I want to talk today about the legendary, um, probably one of the most well-known bands in hard rock and heavy metal. On today's show, we're going to talk about Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden, um, they could be considered pioneers of the um, new wave of British heavy metal. And you could say that. You could say they had, they, they are uh, pioneers. They kind of got the ball rolling on uh New Wave of British Heavy Metal and the popularity uh, burst and the uh, the eruption, I guess you could say, in the U.S. Um, despite little radio and uh, very little television support, Iron Maiden is considered one of the most successful metal bands in history. The New York Times reported in 2010 that they have sold over 85 million albums worldwide. They won the Ivor Novella Award for International Achievement in 2002, and as of October of 2013, they have played over 2,000 live shows during their career. They are, quite frankly, one of the most successful metal bands that are out there. They have released 37 albums, including 15 studio albums, 11 live albums, 4 EPs, and 7 compilations. And let me tell you something, their live albums are... They're they're unbelievable. Iron Maiden was formed on Christmas Day in 1975 by bassist Steve Harris, shortly after he left his previous group called Smiler. He attributes the band's name to a film adaptation of the Alexandre Dumas book, The Man in the Iron Mask which he saw around that time, in which he had a verbal connection 
to the torture device called Iron Maiden. After months of rehearsal, Iron Maiden made their debut at St. Nick's Hall in Poplar on May 1, 1976, before taking up a semi-residency at the Cart and Horses Pub in Maryland Point in Stratford. The original lineup didn't last very long, with vocalist Paul Day being the first casualty as he lacked, in Harris's words, energy or charisma on stage. He was replaced by Dennis Wilcock, who was a KISS fan who used makeup and fake blood during live performances. Wilcock's friend Dave Murray was invited to join due to the dismay of the band's guitarists Dave Sullivan and Terry Rance. Their frustration left Harris to temporarily disband Iron Maiden in 1976, though the group reformed soon after with Murray as the sole guitarist. Steve Harris and Dave Murray remain the band's longest standing members and have performed on every album. Iron Maiden recruited yet another guitarist in 1977 named Bob Sawyer, who was sacked for embarrassing the band on stage but pretending to play guitar with his teeth. Tensions ensued again, causing a rift between Murray and Wilcock, who convinced Harris to fire Murray, as well as original drummer Ron Matthews. A new lineup was put together, including future cutting crew member Tony Moore on keyboards, Terry Wapram on guitar, and drummer Barry Perkis. A bad performance at the Bridge House, which is a pub located in Canning Town in November of 77, was the lineup's first and only concert, and led to Perkis being replaced by Doug Sampson. At the same time, Moore was asked to leave as Harris decided that keyboards did not suit the band's sound. And a few months later, David Wilcock, or Dennis Wilcock, excuse me, decided that he had enough with the group, and he left to form his own band, V1, and Dave Murray was immediately reinstated. As he preferred to be the band's sole guitarist, Wapram disapproved of Murray's return and was also dismissed. Steve Harris, Dave Murray, and Doug Sampson spent the summer and the autumn of 78 rehearsing while they searched for a singer to complete the band's new lineup. A chance meeting at the Red Lion Pub in Leytonstone in November of 78 evolved into a successful audition for vocalist Paul Diano. Steve Harris has said this regarding Paul, quote, there's sort of a quality in Paul's voice, a raspiness in his voice, or whatever you want to call it, that just gave it this great edge, end quote. At the time, Murray was typically uh, would act as their sole guitarist, with Harris saying, quote, Davey was so good he could do a lot of it on his own. The plan was always to get a second guitarist in, but fighting one that could match Davey was really difficult, end quote. On November, actually in uh, New Year's Eve, 1978, they recorded a demo consisting of four songs at the Space Ward Studios in Cambridge. And hoping the recording would help them secure more gigs, they presented a copy to Neil Kay, then managing a heavy metal club called Bandwagon Heavy Metal Soundhouse, located in Kingsbury Circle, which is in northwest London. <sighs> Gotta love coffee. Upon hearing the tape, Kay also began playing the demo regularly at the Bandwagon, and one of the songs, Prowler, um, eventually went to number one in the Soundhouse charts, which were published weekly in a magazine called Sounds. A copy was acquired by Ron Smallwood, who soon became the band's manager. And, um, and as Iron Maiden's popularity increased, they decided to release the demo on their own label as the Soundhouse tapes named after the club. Featuring only three tracks, one song, Strange World, was excluded as the band was unsatisfied with its production. All 5,000 copies were sold within weeks. In December of 1979, the band secured a major deal with EMI. And as Dave Murray's childhood friend Adrian Smith, uh, they, he joined the group as their second guitarist. Um, the band asked uh, Adrian to join and Smith declined as he was busy with his own band, Urchin. So Iron Maiden hired a man named Dennis Stratton as guitarist instead. And shortly after, uh, Doug Sampson left due to health issues, and he was replaced by ex-Sampson drummer Clive Burr at the suggestion of Stratton on November 26th. Iron Maiden's first appearance on an album was on the Metal for Mothers compilation, which was released on February 15th, 1980. 
and with two early versions of Sanctuary and Wrathchild on that release, it led to an ensuing tour which featured several other bands linked with what was known as the new wave of British heavy metal. Iron Maiden's eponymous 1980 release, titled Iron Maiden, debuted at number four in the UK album charts. In addition to the title track, a live version of which would be one of the first music videos aired on MTV, the band included other early favorites. Uh, the album included uh, many, many fan favorites such as Running Free, Transylvania, Phantom of the Opera, Sanctuary, which was not on the original UK release but was made uh, the US version and subsequent remasters. The band set out on a headlining tour of the UK before opening for KISS during their 1980 Unmasked tour, the European leg, as well as supporting Judas Priest on select dates. And after the KISS tour, Dennis Stratton was dismissed from the band as a result of creative and personal differences and was replaced by Adrian Smith in October of 1980. In 1981, Iron Maiden released their second album um, entitled Killers. And quite frankly, that's one of my favorite early Iron Maiden albums. Containing many tracks that have been written prior to their debut release, only two songs were written. Uh, two new songs actually were written for the record, Prodigal Son and Murders in the Rue Morgue. The latter title was taken from the short story by Edgar Allan Poe. Unsatisfied with the production on their debut album, the band hired veteran producer Martin Birch, who would go on to work with Iron Maiden until his retirement in 1992. The result of that album led them to their first world tour, which included their debut performance in the United States, opening for Judas Priest, at the Aladdin Casino in Las Vegas. By 1981, Paul Diano was demonstrating increasingly self-destructive behavior, particularly through his drug usage, about which Diano says, quote, It wasn't just that I was snorting a bit of coke, though I was just doing it f I was just going for it nonstop, 24 hours a day, every day. The band had commitments piling up that went on for months, years, and I just couldn't see my way to the end of it. I knew I would never last the whole tour. It was too much. End quote. With his performances suffering, Diana was immediately dismissed following the Killer World Tour, at which point the band had already selected his replacement. After meeting with Ron Smallwood at the Reading Festival, a band named Bruce Dickinson, who was in a band called Samson, auditioned for Iron Maiden in September of 81 and was immediately hired. The following month, Dickinson went out on the road with the band on a small headlining tour of Italy, as well as a one-off show at the Rainbow Theatre in the UK. For the last show, and in anticipation of their forthcoming album, the band played the songs Children of the Damned and 22 Acacia Avenue, introducing fans to the sounds towards which they were progressing. In 1982, Iron Maiden released... The Number of the Beast, an album which gave them their first ever number one record on the UK charts. And additionally, it became a top ten hit, the song Number of the Beast, in many other countries. At the time, Dickinson was in the midst of legal difficulties with Samson's management and was not permitted to add his name to any of the songwriting credits although he still made what he described as a moral contribution to the song Children of the Damned, The Prisoner, and Run to the Hills. For the first time, actually the second time, the band embarked on a uh, world tour called The Beast on the Road, during which they visited North America, Japan, Australia, and Europe, including a headlining appearance at the Reading Festival. A new and successful chapter in Iron Maiden's future was cemented. And in 2010, the New York Times reported that the album had sold over 14 million copies worldwide. The Beast on the Road's UK leg proved controversial when American conservative political lobbying groups claimed Iron Maiden were satanic because of the new album's title track, to the point where a group of Christian activists destroyed Iron Maiden records as a protest against the band. But in recent years, Dickinson has stated that the band treated this as silliness, and that the demonstrations, in fact, gave them loads of publicity. 
In December of 82, drummer Clive Burr was fired from the band and was replaced by Nico McBrain, previously of the French band Trust. Although Harris states that his dismissal took place because his live performances were affected by offstage antics, Burr objected to this and claimed he was unfairly ousted from the band. Soon after, the band journeyed for the first time to the Bahamas to record the first of three consecutive albums at the Compass Point Studios. In 1983, they released Peace of Mind, which reached the number three spot in the UK and was the band's debut in the North American charts, reaching number 70 on the Billboard 200. Peace of Mind includes the successful singles The Trooper and Flight of Icarus, the latter of which became particularly notable as one of the band's few songs to gain substantial airplay in the US. Soon after the success of Peace of Mind and its supporting tour, the band released Power Slave, on November, uh, September 9th, 1984. The album features fan favorites such as Two Minutes to Midnight, Aces High, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the latter of which is based on a poem of the same name by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and runs over 13 minutes. The tour followed the album, dubbing it the World Slavery Tour, was the band's largest to date, consisting of 193 shows in 28 countries over the course of 13 months playing to an estimated 3,500,000 people. Many of these shows were played back-to-back -back in the same city, such as in uh, Long Beach, California, where they played four consecutive concerts. It was here where the majority of their subsequent live release, Live After Death, was recorded, which became a critical and commercial success, peaking at number four in the UK. Iron Maiden also made their debut appearing in South America, where they co-headlined with Queen at the Rock and Rio Festival to an estimated crowd of 300,000 people. The tour was physically grueling for the band, who demanded six months off when it ended, although this was later reduced to four months. This was the first substantial break in the group's history, including the cancellation of a proposed uh, supporting tour for the new live album, which Bruce Dickinson threatened to quit unless the tour ended. Returning from their time off in 1986, the band adopted a different style for their 1986 album entitled Somewhere in Time. Featured for the first time in the band's history, synthesized bass and guitars to add textures and layers to that sound. The release charted well across the world, and particularly with the single Wasted Years, but notably included no songwriting credits for Bruce Dickinson, whose material was rejected by the rest of the band. While Dickinson was focusing on his own music, guitarist Adrian Smith who typically collaborated with the vocalist, was left to his own devices and began writing songs on his own, coming up with the songs Wasted Gears, Sea of Madness, and Stranger in a Strange Land, the last of which would be the album's second single. The experimentation was evident on Somewhere in Time, and that continued on their next album, called Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, which was released in 1988. That was a concept album, based on the 1987 novel Seventh Son by Orson Scott Card. And this would be the band's first album to include keyboards performed by Harris and Smith, as opposed to guitar synthesizers on the previous release. After its contributions were not used for, uh, Iron, for uh, Somewhere in Time, Dickinson's enthusiasm was renewed as his ideas were accepted for this album. Another popular release became Iron Maiden's second album to hit number one in the UK chart, Although it only achieved a gold certification in the U.S., it's uh, in contrast to the, the uh, four predecessors. During the following tour, the band headlined the Monsters of Rock Festival at Donington for the first time on August 20th, 1988, playing to the largest crowd in the festival's history, 107,000 people. Also included on that bill were Kiss, David Lee Roth, Negadeth, Guns N' Roses, and the power metal band Halloween. The festival was marred, however, by the deaths of two fans in a crowd surge during the Guns N' Roses performance, and the following year's festival was cancelled as a result. The tour concluded with several headlining shows in the UK in November and December of 88, with the concerts at the NEC Arena in Birmingham recorded for a live video entitled Made in England. Throughout the tour, uh, Harris's bass technician, Michael Keeney, provided live keyboards. Keeney has acted as the band's live keyboard player ever since also performing on the band's four following albums before Harris took over as the group's solo studio guitar uh, keyboardist 
for the 2000 release, um, the song Brave New World. During another break in 1989, Adrian Smith released a solo album with his band ASAP entitled Silver and Gold. And Bruce Dickinson began recording work on his solo album with former Gillian guitarist Janet Gers, releasing Tattooed Millionaire in 1990, followed by a tour. At the same time, to mark the band's 10-year recording anniversary, they released a set of 10 CDs and double 12-inch singles called The First 10 Years. Between uh, February 24th and April 28th in 1990, the individual parts were released one by one, each containing two of Iron Maiden singles, including the original B-sides. And soon after, Iron Maiden regrouped to work on a new studio album. And during the pre-production stages, Adrian Smith left the band to differences with Steve Harris regarding the direction the band should be taking, disagreeing with the stripped-down style that they were leaning towards. Janet Gers, having worked on Dickinson's solo project, was chosen to replace Smith and became the band's first new member in seven years. The album No Prayer for the Dying was released in October of 1990 and contained the single Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, the band's first and, to date, only UK singles chart number one, originally recorded by Dickinson's solo outfit for the soundtrack to Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. After another tour and some time off, the band recorded their next studio release, Fear of the Dark, which was released in 1992. Um, it included the standout title track, Fear of the Dark, which is not a regular fixture in the band's live concerts. Achieving their third number one in the UK charts, the disc also featured the number two single, Be Quick or Be Dead, and the number 21 single, From Here to Eternity. The album featured the first songwriting by Gers, and no collaboration at all between Harris and Dickinson. And the extensive worldwide tour that followed included the first ever Latin American leg after a single concert during the World Slavery Tour and headlining the Monsters of Rock Festival in seven European countries, Iron Maiden's second performance at Donington to an audience of 68,000. The attendance was capped after the incident in 1988. It was filmed for an audio and video release called Live at Donington and featured a guest appearance by Adrian Smith, who joined the band to perform the song Running Free. In 1993, Bruce Dickinson left the band to further pursue his solo career but agreed to remain for a farewell tour and two live albums, later released in one package. The first, called A Real Live One, featured songs from 86 to 92 and was released in March of 93. The second, called A Real Dead One, featured songs from 1980 to 1984 and was released after Dickinson had left the band. The tour did not go well with performing uh, with Steve Harris claiming that Dickinson would only perform properly for high-profile shows and that several concerts he would only mumble into the microphone. So Dickinson denies the charge that he was underperforming, stating it was impossible, in his words, to make like Mr. Happy Face if the vibe wasn't right, claiming that news of his exit from the band had prevented any chance of a good atmosphere during the show. He played his farewell show with Iron Maiden on August 28, 1993, which was filmed and broadcast by the BBC and released on home video under the name Raising Hell. In 1994, the band listened to hundreds of tapes sent in by vocalists before convincing Blaze Bailey, formerly of the band Wolfsbane, who had supported Iron Maiden in 1990 to audition for them. Harris preferred his preferred choice from the outset. Bailey had a very different um, vocal style than his predecessor, which ultimately received a very mixed reception uh, among his fans. After a two-year hiatus, as well as a three-year hiatus from studio releases, a record for the band at the time, they returned in 1995, releasing The X Factor. The band had their lowest chart position since 1981 in the UK when that album debuted at number eight. Although it would go on to win Album of the Year awards in France and Germany, the record included the 11-minute epic Sign of the Cross, the band's longest song since Rime of the Ancient Mariner, as well as singles Man on the Edge, based on the film Falling Down, and the song Lord of the Flies, based on the novel of the same name. 
The release is notable for its dark tone, which was inspired by Steve Harris's divorce. The band performed and toured for the rest of 95-96, playing for the first time in Israel and South Africa before stopping to release Best of the Beast. The band's first compilation included a new single called Virus, whose lyrics attacked the critics who had recently um, written off the band. Iron Maiden then returned to the studio in 1988 and released Virtual Eleven. The album's chart scores were the band's lowest to date. It only peaked at number 16 in the UK and it failed to score 1 million worldwide sales for the first time in the history of the band. At the same time, Steve Harris assisted in remastering the band's entire discography up to and including Live in Donington, which was given a mainstream release for the first time. Bailey's tenure in Iron Maiden ended in 1999 when he was asked to leave during a band meeting. The band uh, dismissal took place due to issues that Bailey had experienced with his voice during the Virtual 11 World Tour, although Janet Gers had since stated that it was partly the band's fault for forcing him to perform songs that were beyond his natural register. While the group was considering a replacement for Bailey, Ron Smallwood convinced Steve Harris to invite Bruce Dickinson back into the band. Although Harris admits that he really wasn't into it at first, he then thought, quote, well, if the change happens, who should we get? The thing is, we know Bruce, and we know what he's capable of, and you think, well, better the devil you know. I mean, we got on well professionally for like 11 years and so. After I thought about it, I really didn't have a problem with it, end quote. The band entered into talks with Dickinson, who agreed to rejoin during a meeting in Brighton in January of 1999, and along with Adrian Smith, their guitarist, who was telephoned a few hours earlier or hours later, with Gers, Smith's replacement remaining, Iron Maiden now had a three-guitar lineup: Adrian Smith, Dave Murray, and Janet Gers, and embarked on a hugely successful reunion tour, dubbed the Head Hunter, the Ed Hunter Tour. It tied in with the band's newly released uh, greatest hits collection called Ed Hunter, whose track listing was decided by a poll on the group's website, and which contained a computer game of the same name starring the band's mascot, Eddie. One of Dickinson's primary concerns on rejoining the group was, quote, whether we could in fact be making a real state-of-the-art record and not just a comeback album, which eventually took the form of 2000's release Brave New World. Having disliked the results from Harris's personal studios, Barnyard Studios located on his property in Essex, which had been used for the last four Maiden releases, the band recorded the new release at Guillaume Tell Studios in Paris in November of 1999 with producer Kevin Shirley. Thematic influences continued with the song Wicker Man, which became a single, based on the 1973 British film of the same name and their song Brave New World, taken from the Aldous Huxley novel of the same name. The album furthered the more progressive and melodic sound present in some earlier recordings with elaborate song structures and keyboard orchestration. The world tour that followed consisted of well over 100 dates and culminated with a January 19th show in the year 2000 at Rock in Rio, which is a big festival in Brazil where they played to an audience of around 250,000. While the performance was being produced on uh, CD and DVD under the name Rock and Rio, the band took a year from touring, during which they played three consecutive shows at Brighton Academy in aid of former drummer Clive Burr, who had recently announced that he had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The band performed two further concerts for Burr's MS Trust Fund charity in 2005 and 2007 before, sadly, his death in 2013. Following their, release, following their uh, tour called Give Me Ed Till I'm Dead in the summer of 2003, they released the album um, Dance of Death, which was their 13th album, which met worldwide critical and commercial success. Again, produced by Kevin Shirley, who at that time became their regular producer. Many, uh, many critics felt that their release matched up with their earlier efforts, such as Killers, Peace of Mind, Number of the Beast. And, as usual, there are several historical and literary references with the song Monsignor, 
in particular being about the Cathar stronghold conquered in 1244. Uh, Paskindale refers to a significant battle which took place during the First World War. And during the following tour, the band's performance at Westfallhall in Dortmund, Germany was recorded and released in August of 2005 as a live album and a live DVD entitled Death on the Road. In 2005, the band announced the Eddie Rips Up the World Tour, which tying with their 2004 DVD entitled The History of Iron Maiden Part 1, The Early Years, it only featured material from their first four albums. As part of this celebration of the earlier years, the a number of the Beast single was re-released and went straight to number three in the UK chart. The tour included many headlining stadium as well as festival tours, um, including a performance at the Olvi Stadium in Sweden to an audience of almost 60,000 people. This concert was also broadcast live on satellite television all over Europe to approximately 60 million viewers. Following this run of European shows, the band co-headlined the U.S. festival OzFest with Black Sabbath, their final performance at which uh, earned international press coverage after their show was sabotaged by Ozzy's family, who took offense to Dickinson's comments and remarks against reality TV. The band completed the tour by headlining the Reading and the Leeds Festival in August in the, at uh, the RDS Stadium in Ireland, and for the second time, the band played a charity show for the Clive Burr MS Trust Fund, this time taking place at the Hammersmith Apollo. That same year, the band was inducted into the Hollywood Rock Walk in Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. At the end of 2005, Iron Maiden began working on A Matter of Life and Death, their 14th album, releasing uh, that in August of, uh, and actually in autumn of 2006. While it's not really a, quote, concept album, there are recurring themes such as uh, war, religion, um, just a lot of war and religion themes with that album, as well as um, as well as the, uh, the the cover artwork had a really big um, theme with war and and religion. Um, the release was cr critical and was a commercial success and um, actually uh, earned them a their first top 10 spot in the Billboard award Billboard uh, charts Billboard 200 actually and in 2006 at the classic rock role of honor awards it received the album of the year award a supporting tour followed during which they played the album in its entirety, and the response to this was mixed, to say the least. The second part of the Matter of Life and Death tour, which took place in 2007, was dubbed Matter of the Beast to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Number of the Beast. That included appearances at several major festivals worldwide. That tour opened in the Middle East, and for the first time the band played in Dubai after which they played to over 30,000 people at the Bangalore Palace grounds, making the first concert by any heavy metal band in the Indian subcontinent. The band went on to play a string of European dates, including an appearance at Download Festival, their fourth headline performance at Donington Park to 80,000 people, and on June 24th, they ended the tour with a performance at London's Brighton Academy, to support the Clive Burr MS Trust Fund. On September 9th, or September 5th, excuse me, in 2007, the band announced their Somewhere Back in Time World Tour, which ties in with the DVD release of their Live After Death album. The set list for the tour consisted of successes from the 80s, with a specific emphasis on the Power Slave era for set design, um, the first part of the tour, commencing in Mumbai, India, in February of 2008, it consisted of 24 concerts in 21 cities, traveling nearly 50,000 miles in the band's own chartered airplane named Ed Force One. They played their first ever concerts in Costa Rica and Colombia, and their first shows in Australia and Puerto Rico since 1992. The tour led to the release of 
what some would say uh, controversial, um, a new compilation album called Somewhere Back in Time, which included a selection of tracks from their 1980 debut to 1988's Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, as well as several live versions from Live After Death. The Somewhere Back in Time World Tour continued with two further legs in the U.S. and Europe in the summer of 2008, during which the band used a more expansive stage set, including uh, further elements of the original Live After Death show. With the Seoul UK tour taking place at Twickenham Stadium, this would be the first time the band would headline a stadium in their own country. The three 2008 legs of the tour were remarkably successful, and it was the second highest grossing tour of the year for a British artist. The last part of the tour took place in February and March of 2009, with the band once again using Ed Force One, and that band's first ever appearance in Peru and Ecuador, as well as their return to Venezuela and New Zealand after 19 years. The band also played another show in India, their third in the country within the span of two years. And one thing that uh, that's interesting is that Bruce Dickinson announced on stage at their concert in Sao Paulo that it was the largest non-festival show of their career, with an overall attendance of 63,000 people. On January 20th, 2009, the band announced that they were to release a full-length documentary and would be released in select cinemas in April, entitled Iron Maiden Flight 666. It was filmed during the first part of the Summer Back in Time World Tour between February and March 2008, and it was produced by Banger Productions and was distributed in cinemas by Arts Alliance Media and EMI, with D&E Entertainment sub-distributing in the U.S. The film went on to have a Blu-ray, DVD, and CD release in May and June, topping the music DVD charts in 22 countries. Following announcements that the band had begun composition of a new material, and booked studio time in early 2010 with Kevin Shirley as producer once again. Their album Final Frontier was announced on March 4th. The album, which became the band's 15th, was released in August, garnering critical acclaim and the band's greatest commercial success in their entire history, reaching number one in 28 countries worldwide. Although Steve Harris had been quoted in the passing as claiming that the band would only produce 15 studio albums, both members have since confirmed that there would be at least one more album. That tour saw the band perform 98 shows across the globe to an estimated audience of over 2 million people, including first visits to Singapore, to Indonesia, South Korea, and Transylvania before concluding in London on August 6, 2011. As the tour's 2010 leg preceded the Final Frontier's release, the band made El Dorado available as a free download on June 8th, which would go on to win the award for Best Metal Performance at the Grammys in 2011. It was the band's first win following two previous nominations, in 94 for Fear of the Dark and in 2001 for The Wicker Man. On March 15th, a new compilation to accompany uh, 2009, Somewhere Back in Time, was announced entitled From Fear to Eternity. The original release date was set as May 23rd, but was later pushed back to June 6th. And that double disc set covers the period uh, from 1990 to 2010, the band's most recent eight studio albums. And as on Somewhere Back in Time live versions of Bruce Dickinson were included in place of original recordings, which featured other vocalists, in this case, Blaze Bailey. Um, following confirmation, Actually, in uh, 2012, they announced the Made in England World Tour, which took two years, from 2012 to last year, which was based around the video of the same name. The tour commenced in North America in the summer of 2012 and was followed by further dates in 2013 and 14, which included the band's record-breaking fifth headline performance at Donington, their first show at the newly built National Stadium in Stockholm 
and a return to the Rock and Rio Festival in Brazil, as well as their debut appearance in Paraguay. And in 2012, Steve Harris stated that the Made in England video would be reissued in 2013. And the release date was March 25th in DVD, CD, and an LP format under the title Made in England 88. Following confirmation from the band that 2007's, or 2010's Final Frontier would not be their last album, Bruce Dickinson revealed plans for a 16th album in 2013 with a potential release date this year. But last month, uh, drummer Nico McBrain revealed the new album had been completed, although the release had been put on hold while Bruce Dickinson recovers from treatment from a uh, cancerous tumor that was found on his tongue. Iron Maiden has a lot of history and a lot of, um, I don't know, just a, a lot of, quite honestly, really great songs. And I covered the history of Iron Maiden. And on this next episode that I'll do, I think I'm going to go through their albums one at a time and just talk about the albums themselves, little known facts, talk about the songs. Because a lot of the songs after Paul Diano left and Bruce Dickinson showed up, a lot of the songs have a really, really great literary quality to them based on literature. And I just feel that I, it's important to talk about those as well. So in the next episode, we'll go through the Paul Diano years, the Bruce Dickinson years, the Blaze Bailey years, and um, kind of go through their albums one at a time and just talk about them. So I hope you tune in, and I hope you'll enjoy. And I want to say thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And uh, until next time, take care of yourself and each other. I'll see you guys later.